what powerful songs those are. Uh, as you see the reoccurring theme of glory to Christ our King and the kingdom of God and His mercy and His righteousness that is from everlasting. You'll notice that this is a theme that you will see throughout this this sermon this morning. Uh, we're going to be looking, it's, kind of, it's going to be a unique sermon this morning because the book of Daniel is unique past these next couple chapters. And it's going to take a shift and to clearly understand this shift, and as we look at it, as the end of the book gets into more eschatology or end times uh, uh, visions and symbols and dreams and interpretations, we must have a solid understanding over the overarching theme uh, that we're going to be heading back into. Ultimately, what you're going to see uh, through this book and through the book of Revelation is that all other kingdoms, things that built by the hands of men, they will fall. They will crumble. Uh, the curse of the earth and the Antichrist and these things will come. And uh, I mean, you're going to see great devastation and you're going to see all of these things foretold of. But ultimately, the great victorious thread that is through this is the coming of the kingdom of God. And that is really the the theme. And it's not this doom and gloom type of reading or interpretation. It is this anticipation of the kingdom of God that is coming, whose king and ruler is Jesus Christ, who will rule in justice and in mercy, and, and, and whose kingdom will be forever, and the establishment of this kingdom over all of the kingdoms of mankind. And so that is what we must understand. So today we're going to be looking, the title of the sermon is A Biblical Perspective on kings and kingdoms because it we really need to grasp this because life is really all about perspective uh, so much is attached to how we perceive things in life and uh, I always tell people uh, and you hear me say this a lot that your emotions are indicators of what you believe or your perspective and the greatest thought you can think is what you think about God and and the perspective that you see the world and we must have a biblical worldview so what we're going to see today as this is kind of grabbing this thread uh, from the first six five chapters that we've seen, and that you've seen this consistent thread for through these first five chapters in each and every story, but then you're, you're going to take that thread and you're gonna, we're going to use it to be the interpretive key for the last half of the book of Daniel. So it's important that we kind of have this, almost this second introduction to kind of grasp this, build this foundation, and then interpret the latter half of the book of Daniel. So perspective is vital. It's absolutely vital uh, because we easily get wrapped up into the day-to-day, moment-to-moment details of our life and circumstances. Uh, we, 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 we get wrapped up in what's happening and we get wrapped up in the circumstances. We get wrapped up in the problems and the stress and the anxiety and we get wrapped up in all these things and we, we tend to lose sight of what's really important. Our perspective changes. And let me encourage you if, you, if our perspective is constantly in all of these things, your outlook on life will not be without, will be without joy. It will be without faith and you will constantly filled with anxiety, worry, fear, doubts, concerns. And so as we look at this, it's going to give us a overarching view of the biblical perspective of kings and kingdoms. And how do we look at kings? I mean, rulers, presidents, uh, kings, queens, what, the rulers of nations, how do we look at them? And how do we look at nations? What is the biblical perspective? Because lots of times we as Christians get caught up into all of these things. And what you're going to see in this thread is that we are exiles. We are sojourners in a, a foreign land, okay? And, and that we are to live for one king and one kingdom. And that's really what you've seen as a thread, but it, we're going to use it to interpret the rest. And so you can tell that we've lost a lot of perspective in life. If you don't believe me, just for a moment, just for a moment, don't do this long term because it'll drive you crazy, okay? If you watch the news, if you watch CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, whatever you watch, okay, they demonstrate this perfectly. They demonstrate a lack of perspective. Man that does not have hope lives in the constant happenings of men. Christians have a biblical perspective of things and see the bigger picture, and they can live in the midst of chaos in faith, and they can live in the midst of chaos in joy. Why? 
because they have a biblical perspective of what God is doing on a larger scale. It, they're not wrapped up in the individual things. And one way to know that you've lost perspective is you, you hear people speak in superlatives or absolutes. They, the, when everything is either the greatest, we're the best, we're, we're the greatest, we're, we're, we've done everything, or you know, look at us, or they speak in absolute worst. I mean, it's these two extremes, and that's when you know that people have lost perspective, okay? And, and when nothing will ever compare to what we have accomplished, or when everybody is thinking and doing and talking about these doom and gloom, or everyone's thinking the same things, and they try to fit you into these two categories of the greatest, the highest, and the best, or the worst, the doom and the gloom. And these are the two extremes. When people lose perspective of what's really going on, they fall into one of these two categories, okay? And so we must have a biblical perspective of Christians as a biblical worldview as kings and kingdoms, because the world is looking to the church, the gathered body, at, to be the light and the dark time. And now if we are just like everyone else that is living in these two categories, we will fail to be the light of Jesus Christ in a dark world. And this is what Daniel and his friends are doing. They are lights in the midst of chaos, in the midst of a crumbling kingdom of men, in the midst of sin, cursed, I mean, uh, pagan worship. I mean, they're lights during this time. And that's what you and I as believers were called to do as citizens of another kingdom. And so, Perspective is the difference in our reactions. It's the difference in our reactions. You remember, I remember, um, I remember when I was first grade, kindergarten or first grade, and uh, I remember this girl on this playground that um, she, you know, when you're a little kid, she wrote me a note and I thought she liked me and, and I, you know, I was, I was really elated and then I opened the note and uh, she called me some kind of, of name. And I remember just coming home crushed. And I remember going to my grandma, she used to babysit me. I remember going to her and telling her about this, this girl in first grade who just crushed me. And I said, life is never going to be the same. And I remember crying and weeping and, and my grandma, she comforted me and she goes, it will be okay. Life will go on. But at that moment, to my perspective, life was ending. It was over. What, what was the difference? How could my grandma not be so sensitive to my feelings? She didn't know. See, she had perspective. She understood that I was a first grader. She understood that these things weren't going to be this way forever, that life was going to go on, things were going to change. What was the difference in the reactions was perspective. And that's what you and I need to have um, in this life, because we live in a world that is full of, it's consumed with a lack of perspective. And you will hear this, and this is the, probably the, the, the theme that we're seeing today in our world, is this doom and gloom, this, this fear, this hysteria that is being promoted. Um, and I believe this with all of my heart. What is going on right now? If you think that what's going on in our world is a, is a right-wing Republican versus a left-wing Democrat, you're wrong. It is the difference between the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness, okay? And you must understand that there are principalities and powers and rulers of this air that are at work, and this is against the kingdom of light. I want you to understand that. We must have a biblical worldview. But what is happening? Who is the author of confusion and fear? Satan. I want you to understand this. This in confu- fear and this hysteria, this doom and gloom, what it does is it muddies believers' perspectives on life. And it gets everyone living in fear. It gets everyone living in hysteria. It gets everyone living in the what ifs. And, you know, we got to do this and we got to promote this. And we got to live like this. And we, you know, if this is, it's all going to end. And you, and you see these things happening. But the book of Daniel has provided us much needed perspective on the kingdoms of men and the kingdom of and the kings of men. So I want you to, we're going to overview the verse, the last couple weeks that we've looked at. I want you to see this. If you remember with me back in Daniel chapter number one, we'll see the failure of earthly kingdoms. Daniel chapter one, it's on your screen. It says this, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord, remember this, the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the articles of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his God. And he brought the articles into the treasure house of his God. 
Then the king instructed Ashvez, the master of the eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles. Young men in whom there was no blemish, but good-looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge and quick to understand, who had ability to serve in the king's palace and whom they might teach the language and the literature of the Chaldeans. So what you're going to see here, if you remember, is the kingdom of Israel. 400 years before this besiegement, Israel was the greatest nation on the face of the earth. David was their great king. He had defeated all of their enemies. He had expanded their borders. He had expanded their lands. He had collected gold. He had collected silver, wealth. He had uh, collected the precious stones and, and the building materials needed for the construction of God's temple. And then his son Solomon um, had taken Israel to the greatest heights it's ever seen. He had constructed this breathtaking temple. I mean, a site that nothing's ever been seen like this up until this time. A magnificent palace and kings from, and rulers from all other nations sent him gifts and tribute to this great kingdom. Uh, everyone ultimately looked up to Israel. They were number one. They were the best. They were the greatest. And everyone honored them as such. But as you read, as we come into this, some, some uh, 400 years later, you see that this is not the case anymore. Those days were gone because the bickering and the fighting had caused Israel to split into two nations. And let me tell you something. Every, if you study world history, the fall of a nation in any nation is when it splits itself. When you have two extremes and people fighting from two different perspectives and they cannot come to an agreement for the betterment of their nation. If this is Rome, this is Babylon, this is all nations that have ever crumbled is because there was two warring parties that split up a nation. They will devour each other because when one seeks power over another, they will destroy an entire nation as they seek to destroy one another. That is the fall of every nation in the history of the world. Does that sound familiar? Warning. That but had caused the split of the two nations in Israel. One of those nations had already been defeated and ransacked, so there was the, all that was left is now Judah. And it was now Judah, as it came into Daniel chapter number one, was now given to the Babylonians by the Lord. It was gone. The great kingdom of Israel was gone. It was defeated. It had split and it crumbled and it had fell. Once this great nation has now crumbled. And this was God's people it had fallen. And they, because of their sin and because of their idolatry and because of their division, God let his nation fall into the Babylonians' hand. He gave it to them. But then you don't, it doesn't stop there. So you see the past, and then you're coming up to Daniel, and you see this, this, this glorious kingdom of Babylon. Yet this kingdom fell. This ki- and we looked at it last week, and that's why I wanted to talk about this this week. The failure of Babylon. Because what we witness with Israel's failure, we also see the failure of the nation of Babylon. Under Nebuchadnezzar's leadership, the, this kingdom had, you remember we looked at it last, or in chapter number 4, it had branched out. L- let's look at it in Daniel chapter 4. Look what it says. Look how great this kingdom was. The tree that you saw, which grew and became strong, whose height reached to the heavens and which could be seen by all of the earth, much like Israel, whose leaves were lovely and its fruit abundant, in which was food for all under the beasts of the field dwelt, and in whose branches the birds of heaven had their home. It is you, O king, you have grown and become strong, for your greatness has grown and reaches to the heavens and your dominion to the end of the earth. And I want you to see this. Babylon had just, just like Israel, had, had grown, had grown powerful, had grown great, and had reached down even all the way to Egypt. And they, as they had conquered, Nebuchadnezzar um, brought, them, brought Babylon into this glorious state to revitalize this nation and then establish the capital city of Babylon. 
And that's what is covered through the book of Daniel. And we, as we've seen these stories, and you've seen what happened in Nebuchadnezzar's life, as, as, remember as this golden statue that he created, and this dream that came, and that Babylon was very short-lived. It was great. It was golden. It was powerful. It was the greatest kingdom that's ever been. And yet, it was very short. It was just this head of gold. What God is showing through the book of Daniel is that nations will rise and they will fall. They are short-lived. Then these kings will come and they will go. They are short-lived. You cannot... Put your trust into the kings in the kingdoms of this world. And so what we've seen that Daniel wasn't exaggerating when he was talking about the greatness. He wasn't just buttering up this king. He wasn't just talking to him and and flattering him. Um, Babylon was truly a great, a great nation. But what happens when we turn to chapter number five, 34 years later, his grandson, um, look at the, we just looked at it right last week, the writing on the wall. And if you remember the writing, it said, the writing on the wall, it says this, and this is the inscription that was written, mene, mene, tekel, this is the interpretation of each word, mene, God has numbered your kingdom, see, limited the kingdom, who numbered it? God did, God decides when these kingdoms rise and when they fall, and it, fi- and it is finished it, God finished it, tekel, you have been numbered, you have been weighed in the balances, and you have been found wanting, whereas your kingdom has been divided, see, just like Israel, whenever a kingdom is divided, it will fall. Your kingdom has been divided, and it has been given to the Medes and to the Persians. That very night, Belshazzar, now this is his grandson of Nebuchadnezzar, king of the Chaldeans, was slain. And now remember the second kingdom, the, the metal Persian kingdom, and Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. So what we see is past kingdoms fall. And if we work through the present um, and, and through the book of Daniel, we see that Babylonian kingdom has fallen. The great nations, the great kings, they have fallen. The kingdom of Babylon was conquered. It was done in less than 75 years since Nebuchadnezzar took the throne of Babylon. His magnificent kingdom, guess what? It failed. Israel failed. Babylon failed. And then what you're going to see, and this is why it's important that we understand this, because as we get into the latter half of the book of Daniel, you're going to see these things. You're going to see um, the statue of, of, that Nebuchadnezzar set up. You're going to see it being played out. You're going to see it all the way through to the very end of, uh, of the book of Revelation. And this is what we must understand as its interpretive key. If you look at the first half of Daniel, we witness these failures of these kingdoms. But the second half of this book is full of visions. These visions produce countless debates and arguments of biblical scholars of what they are meaning. Um, But I want you to understand what it is definitely featuring the main point of what it is featuring in this, we can debate about the, all the little side pieces and all these things, but the main feature that we can all agree on is indisputable, that all earthly kingdoms will eventually fall. None of them will last. They will all fail, and Christ will come in his judgment and in all of his power and all of his glory, and he will establish his earthly kingdom here on this earth. That is what all scholars, no matter what your view of eschatology is, all of them agree on that, that Christ is coming again to establish his kingdom here on this earth. So don't be surprised when you live in a world where kingdoms fail. Kings fail. Don't be surprised. It is a biblical perspective we must have as Christians. Look at Daniel chapter 8, and we'll look at this. Daniel chapter 8. The ram which you saw, this is one of those visions, and we'll look at more of it in depth. I just want to give you this, this overview. The ram which you saw having the two horns, they were the kings of the media, Persia Empire. Remember that second empire? And the male goat is the kingdom of Greece, that third empire. And so it's repeating what we saw in Daniel chapter 2. Remember these things as we go on. The large horn that is between its eyes is the first king. And for the broken horn and the four that stood up on its place, the four kingdoms shall arise out of that nation, but not with its power. And in the latter time of the kingdom, of their kingdom, when the transgressions, when the transgressors, Do you see this, church? This is what it says in the New Testament. As things go on, things will get worse and worse. And when the latter times come, the end days, as things get worse and worse, look what happens. When the transgressors have reached their fullness. Mark that. 
Because you're going to live in a world where transgressors are getting worse and worse. The sins are getting worse and worse. Days are getting darker and darker. When will these things come? When the transgressors have reached their fullness, the fullness of the depravity of man will be evidenced in the tribulation time. And But things will get worse and worse during then. A king shall rise having fierce features, who understands the sinister schemes. His power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. He shall destroy fearfully and shall prosper and thrive, and he shall destroy the mighty and also the holy people. We'll talk about this in more detail as we go. Through his cunning, he shall cause deceit to prosper under his rule, and he shall exalt himself in his heart. He shall destroy many in their prosperity. He shall even rise from the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without human means. So I want you to see this. Even the Bible foretells that the fullness of transgressions, when this, and we're going to see as Jesus came, things are going to get worse and worse until he returns. That's why we are constantly awaiting Jesus and his kingdom that will come. We are constantly expecting and anticipating imminent, his imminent return. But what you see to be true, and even as it spoke of this Antichrist and his kingdom, the one world religion, the one world government, and this Antichrist who will deceive the world and make uh, people bow down before him, just like we witnessed in Daniel chapter number two, all of these kings, they rise and they fall. Even the great Antichrist will fall. And another kingdom will arise. But what we see is this timeline that kingdoms rise, they fall. Kingdoms rise, they fall. Kingdoms rise, and they fall. And this is the historical theme through the history of man. And you and I, we live in these nations. All believers of all times, we live in these nations. And if we put our hope into our nation and into the rulers of our nation, we will be sorely displeased and displeasured when our nation rises and when it falls, when its leaders rise and when they fail. We will be displeased. And we can see all of these handwritings in our own country right now. A nation divided. Yes. Great power, great splendor of the past. But we are divided. And if America does not turn back to God, we will suffer the same fate as all of these other nations that forgot about their God. Mark my words. And when we see, we we see all these things, I I gotta hurry. Brothers and sisters, let me encourage you. Don't put your hope in the future of a kingdom of men. Don't put your hope in a king of this man or a ruler or a president or whatever capacity state is. So many people fall into the trap of believing that this king and this kingdom will save them, will rescue them, will provide for them. My friends, that is wrong. Don't put your hope in politicians or politics. Don't put your hope in some legislative sweeping reform. We tried that um, with the moral majority with uh we we and we can realize that that is not our purpose as christians our purpose as christians is to advance the kingdom of god and to wait for the king that will come that we know that we are living as exiles and sojourners in these worlds and these kingdoms that will rise and they will fall but our hope is not placed in the success of those kings or kingdoms but that does not mean now listen closely We don't have our hope placed there. We don't have our trust placed there. We are living with joy, just like Daniel, just like Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego. We are living in the midst of it. We're not trusting them. We're not looking them to be our saviors. We're not worshiping them. We won't bow down, but we do live among the people of these nations, and we are called to be good citizens of these kingdoms. We are to honor the kings and these authorities that God has placed, but we don't worship them. We don't trust them as in our faith. We don't put our faith into them. We have our faith in one king and one kingdom. But as we live here in this world as exiles, we are to live as as citizens of a greater kingdom and of a greater king, of a higher authority. And so we are to be good citizens that are, are living this higher moral law out in our lives that display the glories of our one true king. And so we are to be good citizens, working diligently for the good of our kingdom. And we see that Daniel provides a great example of this in the first five chapters, and you'll see it in chapter number six, with a faithful to service to God and trusting God where God had placed him and living out his faith as an exile in this foreign country. As Christians, 
I was going to read a verse, but I, I'm, for the sake of time, I'm, I'm going to skip it. If you can read it later, Jeremiah 29, verses 4 and 7. It really tells us how we should live and what the prophet of Jeremiah told the, uh, the captive Israel to how to live during this time. But as Christians, we should be good citizens, the greatest citizens. We should seek the welfare of our city, of our state, and of our nation. We should be productive and be blessings to people. We should encourage our government to fulfill its God-given mandate to protect the innocent and to punish the evildoer. That is why we as Christians, we live as this prophetic voice to the rulers of this king, of these kingdoms and these kings. We live as this prophetic voice proclaiming the authority of the one true king and the highest law of the land. The highest law of the land is God's word. And we as believers are to be prophetic in our voice of proclaiming the great high law and to be displaying that. That's why we stand against abortion. That's why we stand against systematic racism and injustice. That's why we stand against um, murder. That's why we stand against poverty and oppression of the poor. That's why we stand against those that are starving, those that are being oppressed, the sick, the lowly. That's why we as believers, we stand with them because we believe there is a greater law. And that is God's law, that every man is created equal in the sight of God, and we stand for life from the womb to the tomb. That is, we are seeking this, the, the, this restorative justice because it is declaring the one who is just. Man and his kingdoms will be unjust in their laws, seeking their own personal benefit, and we as believers must live as lights. We must not bow down to these things. We might not trust these things because we are subservient to one king and one kingdom. We live as citizens in Babylon of a different country, the kingdom of God. And so it is appropriate for us to engage in these things and to stand for the rights, but we must be mindful that we never put our hope in the state We never put our hope in politicians. We never put our hope in legislative reform. We put our hope in Christ because he is the authority. Because we don't put our hope in an earthly kingdom because we realize and we have a biblical perspective that all earthly kingdoms will fall. So I want you to see these things and we'll be done. I want you to see the greatness of the kingdom of God. There is no comparison between the two. God's earthly kingdoms are ev- earthly kingdoms aren't even a pale imitation of what God's heavenly kingdom is. God is sitting enthroned and on the, upon the universe, and He rules over all the affairs of men. Do you rem- and we're going to read a lot of verses really quick, but I want you to understand these three things, and we'll be done. That God rules over all of the kings. All of the world leaders, do you know who rules over them all? God does. Just as he did with Nebuchadnezzar's and Belshazzar and all of these kingdoms. And when he gave this image, when they were going to rise and when they were going to fall and who was going to take their place. Do you know who allowed it all? God. I'll prove it to you. We're going to read some verses really fast, but I want you to see them. Look at Daniel chapter 1. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim king of Judah, into his hand with some of the articles of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of God, and he brought the articles of treasure into the house of God. God gave Judah into their hand. Daniel chapter 2, look at this thread. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his, and he changes the times and seasons. Listen to this. He removes the kings and he raises up the kings. Who does? God. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. Daniel chapter 2, verse 37, look at this. You, O king, are the king of kings, for the God of heaven has given you a kingdom of power, strength, and glory. And wherever the children of men dwell, or the beasts of the field, and the birds of the heaven, he has given them into your hand. Who does? God. And he has made you ruler over them. You are the head of this of gold. Verse 47 The king answered Daniel and said, Truly your God is the God of gods, the Lord of kings, and the revealer of secrets, since you could reveal this secret. Daniel chapter 4. Watch this thread. It's important because you'll need it to understand the latter half 
of Daniel. This decision is by the decree of the watchers and the sentence by the word of the holy ones in order that the living may know that the most high rules in the kingdom of men. And he gives it to whomever he will and he sets over it the lowest of men. You see that? They shall drive you from men. Your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and they shall make you eat grass of the ox, and they shall wet you with the dew of heaven, and seven times shall pass over you, till you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he chooses. Do you see this thread here? Daniel chapter 4, verse number, oh, verse 26. And as much as they gave the command to leave the stump and roots of the tree, your kingdom shall be assured to you after you come to know that heaven rules. Verse 32. And they shall drive you from men, and your dwelling shall be of the beasts of the field. They shall make you eat grass, and seven times shall pass over you until you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he chooses. Verse 35. Watch this. And all the heavens of the earth are reputed as nothing. He does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of earth. No one can restrain his hand or say to him, what have you done? Verse 37, now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven of all whose works are truth and his ways justice. And those who walk in pride, he is able to put down. Verse 18, O king, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar, your father, a kingdom and majesty and glory and honor. Verse 21, and that he was driven from the sons of men. His heart was made like the beasts and his dwelling was with the wild donkeys. They fed him with grass like oxen and his body was wet with the dew till he knew that the most high God rules in the kingdom of men and appoints over it whomever he chooses. I'm going to stop there for the sake of time, but I want you to see we had uh, one, two, three more verses to read. But what you see is that God chooses whom he allows to rise to power. He allows, he chooses if a nation rises. He chooses when a nation falls. He chooses a king or a president that is elected. He chooses when they're not or when they fall. It's up to God because he is the God of heaven. He is our God. He is our king. He is, his kingdom is over all right here, right now, from the very beginning to the end. God's kingdom is reigning and ruling over the kingdoms of men. And what he is saying to us as Christians, don't put your trust into these things. Don't put your hope into these things because I'm telling you, they're all going to rise. They're all going to fall, even unto the great day when the fullness of the transgressors have come to this fullness the Antichrist will rise. He will bring this one world government and he will sit on the top of it and demand worship of himself. You'll see this one world, but even that great day, that will fall because we are waiting the one true king when his kingdom will come. And just like we read in that vision, that great rock that is not cut with the hands of men, that kingdom that is not made from man comes and it crushes all of the kingdoms of men that God will establish his kingdom here on this earth and he will rule on this earth forever. That is the great promise that we have that, and that we see that God rules over all of time. I don't have time to look at these verses, but you'll see this, this. The book that we have seen already in Daniel, it proves that God rules over all of time from the very beginning to the very end. In Isaiah, it says that God has set the end from the very beginning, that God's plan will be carried out exactly how God says it has carried out. When he gave the vision of the kingdoms to Nebuchadnezzar, he had given him a prophetic vision of what was to come exactly when these kingdoms would rise and when they would fall. He knew their length. He knew exactly when they would fall. And that is true for every kingdom on this earth. You and I as believers, we live in these kingdoms, but our hope is not in these kingdoms. Our hope is not in these kings of men. We are citizens of another kingdom. We are citizens of another king. We have a different law, and we live in the midst of them. It's about prophetic voice calling them to repent of their sin and to place their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, the king and the ruler of all mankind. That is why we are here. We are to be citizens of the kingdom of God. We are to live differently. We are to talk differently. We are to put our hope in things not of this earth, not in these perspectives of, uh, of these extreme perspectives of doom and gloom or everything's just great and it's going to be great. No, 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 no. We have this biblical perspective that nations are going to rise and they're going to fall. Things are going to get worse and worse. 
And we are just exiles here, and we are awaiting the kingdom and the king to come and to establish his kingdom. But until then, we live as exiles in a foreign world, and we are to live differently. That is the biblical narrative. That's what you see from Genesis to Revelation. And we see, um, we see that God rules over all time. And you will see that our hope in God's eternal kingdom is what allows us to be faithful in the midst of a wicked, pagan, earthly kingdoms. If you look at Daniel 3 and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, uh, they, they were just faithful in the midst of pure wickedness and pure evil. They were faithful to God. They didn't get caught up. They didn't bow down to what culture was saying. They didn't bow down to the kings. They didn't. They bowed to one king. They had no king but Christ. And that's how we are to live. Daniel gave us this example. And I, I got to hurry. But these men understood that the temporary nature of earthly kingdoms. And they remember, but they remembered, even though these earthly kingdoms are temporary, even though circumstances around us are chaos, they remembered the greatness of God's coming kingdom. And whenever these two kingdoms came into conflict, and you and me as believers, we are torn because so, it's so easy for us to get caught up in the what's going on and the falling of a kingdom and the, the fullness of transgressions and the depravity of man being displayed and we get worried and fearful. But this is where the boldness comes from is that when these two kingdoms, the kingdom of light and the kingdom of God, came in conflict with the kingdoms of men, they demonstrated a constant and consistent unwillingness to compromise their obedience to Christ, their true king. What about us? Do you struggle to remember where your true citizenship lies? Do you seek first the kingdom of God in the midst of kingdom of men? Or are we and our faith compromising and getting caught up in all of these affairs of the kings and the kingdoms of men and the depravity and the fullness of transgressors that are taking place. Do we get caught up in all these things? Ultimately, there is coming a day God will establish his earthly kingdom. Daniel chapter 7 points to that. I don't have time to read it. Daniel 7 verse 13 and 14. That God will establish a literal earthly kingdom on this earth. And this kingdom will be ruled by the one that is called the Son of Man. And we see in Psalms, too, that the Son of Man is Jesus Christ. That there is coming a day, this great day, when the fullness of the transgressors have come to the fullness, and these nations have risen and fallen, that there is coming a day where Jesus will come in all of his glory. And he is not coming as a lamb this time, but he is coming of the, as a lion of the tribe of Judah. He is coming in the fullness of his wrath and the fullness of his judgment. And he will, quick, he will judge the quick and the dead. He will judge the world. He will bring justice. He will bring peace. And it will only come, peace will only come when the Prince of Peace arrives on this earth again. And that is what you and I have our hope fixed on. If we have our hope and our joy tied to the kings and to the kingdoms of men, you will, your joy will fail. It will flounder. You won't really have hope. But when you know that you're a citizen of a coming king and a coming kingdom and you're awaiting that day, you can live with a biblical perspective of what's going on and how it's going to happen and how I can live with joy in the midst of chaos, how I can be light in the midst of darkness because you know what's happening. And I got to hurry. Brothers, sisters, Christians, we serve a king that will never fail. We, serve, we live in a kingdom that will never crumble. I want to ask you this. Are you a servant of the king, King Jesus? Does your life reflect the authority of Christ, that he is your authority? Does your perspective, does your emotions, what your joy is attached to, does it reflect faith in the coming kingdom of God? 
you know, I, I say this in jest, but so many of us live for the glories of the kingdoms of men and the kings of earth, that our joy is attached to it. And you know what that's a lot like? I'm a Detroit Lions fan. And you understand what that means to be a Detroit Lions fan, don't you? It is tough to constantly cheer for a team that literally never wins. I get our hopes up every year. This is going to be our year. Did you see what we did? Did you see the draft? This is it. We're going to the Super Bowl this year. Uh, Oh, and it's always this. I hope that it's going to come this year. I hope. But that's my team. Could you imagine if I walked around this earth or just this church and going, man, the Detroit Lions, they're so great. They're awesome. They're the best. What would you say to me? Could you imagine if I just say they're the greatest of all time, but the evidence shows otherwise? You'd be like, Pastor James, they haven't had a winning season in like 10 years. Pastor James, they're always in last place for the last like 50 years. They're one of the worst organizations in the NFL. And you're talking about how great they are and your hopes and your joys placed in how good they're going to be this upcoming year. Imagine if I took it a step further and decided in Fenton, Michigan, Pastor James is going to host a parade and talk about how good the Detroit Lions are. World champions. You would think I'm crazy. It would be empty and meaningless because the glory being called the best of being called world champions does not belong to them. And it is the same thing when Christians champion for the kings of this earth and the kingdoms of this earth. We should not be champions. Our trust should not be in the kings or kingdoms of this world. We are to champion the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that there is a king and there is a kingdom coming and he is coming soon, that you and that all the glory belongs to Jesus Christ. All of the praise of the universe belongs to Jesus Christ. All of the worship belongs to him. The praise of every tongue, the song of every soul, the worship of every heart, the boast of every tongue, all of it belongs to him, King Jesus And we live in a midst of a kingdom that will crumble. So let us live for a kingdom that will last forever. May our song sing forever the anthem of our kingdom, that Jesus Christ is coming again to judge the world. He is going to establish his kingdom, but until that day, there's a great message, the message of the kingdom of God. Repent and believe the gospel. Repent of your sins. You have sinned against the highest law of the land, the greatest king. You have sinned against his declarations. You have broken his law. And you will endure the wrath of this just king one day. So repent. Turn from your sins because this king, he is merciful. He is a king, but he made himself like you and me. And he took our sins upon himself on the cross and he died in our place, that you and I can be free from the the sins of our life, the sins that we have committed, that you and me can be forgiven, justified, declared innocent, and then adopted to be the child of the king, the citizens of another kingdom, where our hope is not built on sand, but it's built on the rock of Jesus Christ. What is your hope built on? Is it on Jesus Christ, the King, and His kingdom? Are you living as an exile? Or have you allowed the hysteria, the fear, the lack of perspective, the doom and gloom to cloud these things, to get caught up in all of these things that you've forgotten to glorify the one true King? We must understand and have a biblical perspective of kings and kingdoms if we are going to interpret the latter half of the book of Daniel. I hope this is an encouragement to you as it is to me that God is sovereignly ruling over all of the kingdoms of men. He is in control of their rise and of their fall that we don't have to fear that we can trust in him. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for its power. 
Father, help us as believers to have our faith rested in one true king. Father, that we would not look to some politicians or some politics or some rulers or legislative reform or anything, but what we need is a sweeping move of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, help me. Lord, I fail in this too. I sin. Lord, I get caught up in all these things. But Lord, help me. Help our church, Lord, to be so full of the kingdom of God that our message is one message. Yes, these kingdoms will crumble. Yes, they will fall. But there is hope. There is hope there is a king that will never fail. There is hope there is a kingdom that's coming that will never fall. It will be established. And entrance into this kingdom is by placing your faith and trust into Jesus Christ. So Lord, I pray that you would help us to be proclaimers of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that we live for your glory. Help us to be exiles, sojourners, in these, in these nations, Lord. Help us to be prophetic and calling them to repentance, to pointing out their sin and their wickedness, and to point them to Jesus Christ, the merciful King. Lord, help us in this endeavor. Help us as we continue in the book of Daniel, as we gain a perspective of the things to come. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. All right, church, thanks for joining us this morning. Uh, we are going to transition to our outdoor service at this time, so I hope to see you guys there. Or if not, if we don't see you, uh, if you need anything, please give me a call, text me, email me, stay in contact with me uh, if you need anything. We're here for you guys. We love you. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.